So in this section of class, we're going to talk about biopsychology. So biopsychology, sometimes called physiological psychology, uh, sometimes called neuropsychology, um, and those are slightly different terms, sometimes used synonymously. Um, this is basically the study of the biological underpinnings of human behavior and cognition. So how you think, how you behave. Um, there are a lot of different areas that we can go into. The, the primary focus for this part of the class is to talk about um, basically the different parts of the brain, what they focus on. Uh, we're going to talk about the neuron, which is the uh, basic nerve cell, um, how neurons fire, and essentially the biological underpinnings of everything you think and do. So the first thing to talk about is the structure of a neuron. Um, a neuron, again, is just a nerve cell. Um, it's just like most other cells you might learn in a, a normal biology class, but there are specific structural features of a neuron that make it a little bit different. Um, the basic structure of a neuron is right here on your screen. You have the, um, the cell body, also called the soma, that's this main portion here. You have the dendrites, which are these uh, tree branch looking structures that kind of pull off. And then you have an axon. An axon, to simplify it, is just this long connection out here to, again, other dendrites. Now, the axon is covered with something called myelin, which creates this myelin sheath. And it's just a structure of like a series of. Uh, fatty tissue wrappings. What that does, it's kind of like insulation on an electrical wire. It helps with transmission, kind of speeds up the process of transmitting a signal from one neuron to the next, which is a really good thing. Now, from here, from the uh, cell body, information is going to pass along this axon, and information in the form of basically a, a, an electrochemical reaction. It's going to go from right here on this neuron all the way down the axon and it's sped up again by this myelin sheath and then the information is going to be disseminated from these dendrites here onto additional dendrites on the receiving neuron. Now neurons don't technically connect. They're not actually attached to other neurons which is kind of a fascinating thing. Instead, there is this small gap from one neuron to the next. And in that gap, a lot of really important things will happen. So that area where it looks like they connect is called the synapse, and the gap between it is um, sort of unimaginatively called the synaptic gap or the synaptic cleft. Um, this gap is where things called neurotransmitters are going to be released. So Basically what happens is information is passed along one neurotransmitter to the next and this up top is going to be the presynaptic neuron, so this is the sending neuron. Um, it's going to release things called neurotransmitters out into this gap. Neurotransmitters are just chemicals basically. Different, um, different neurotransmitters do different things. We'll talk about those in a moment. And then those uh, neurotransmitters are going to be released out into this gap and then attached to different um, receptor sites on the receiving neuron. Now when enough receptors are activated another reaction starts on this neuron and you have this cascading of events. Now I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about action potentials but the gist of an action potential is it's basically the the term used to describe all of some kind of um, electrical stimulation, some passing of um, neuronal information from one neuron to the next. And an action potential works like this. So the resting state for any neuron is about negative 70 millivolts. Um, so it's slightly negatively polarized what happens eventually is that as neurotransmitters are 
essentially released or that they react to receptor sites, channels open up on the neuron and it changes the polarization of the neuron. And once it reaches this threshold of about negative 55 millivolts, that kicks off a cascading of events. So a bunch of channels open up, it becomes more um, positively charged, and then it corrects, and it overcorrects back to lower than it was before, and then comes back to around negative 70. So think of it as this cascading of events happening all along that um, sort of rope structure called the axon. And that results in neurotransmitters being released out into the gap, which kicks off another action potential and another and another and another. And it's not just this linear fashion, it actually does sort of a branching out structure. So you have this incredible pattern of your neurons lighting up kind of symbolically and, and this um, spreading of a charge across your brain. And that results in all kinds of things. It could be a thought, a feeling, um, a sensation, it could be a memory, it could be anything. Now one of the things that's really interesting is after those neurotransmitters are released out into this gap, the ones that are left over are going to be recycled, a process called reuptake, back into the sending axon. And reuptake becomes really important later on in the semester as we talk about something like depression. So one of the ways that depression medication can work is through blocking the reuptake of neurotransmitters. So for instance, things like Prozac or Lexapro are what are called SSRIs, Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitors. And what that drug does is it blocks the recycling of serotonin. So serotonin in key parts of the brain is involved in happiness and what we can do is block the recycling, the reuptake of serotonin, which means more activation on the neuron, and that results in sort of a more positive feeling, a way to combat depression. So again, we've got uh, neurotransmitters here. These are just chemical messengers of the nervous system. They're kind of like locks and keys. Um, here are a few of the key ones. The ones that we'll primarily focus on are dopamine. This has to do with mood, sleep, and learning. Um, and serotonin also mood and sleep. Norepinephrine, um, think of kind of like adrenaline. In fact, epinephrine and adrenaline are basically the same thing, so it's noradrenaline. Um, if you have a norepinephrine boost, you can think of what might uh, happen if you had an adrenaline boost. 